Hey god, you want to play Settlers of Catan? No way. I don't want to force you to believe that I exist. What? One of the age-old questions in Christian theology is, why is God so hidden? If there really is a God who is omnipotent and who wants a loving relationship with us, then why hasn't this God made his existence a lot more obvious? God could walk around in the Garden of Eden, so why can't he join us for a board game? You know, like our family and friends do, with whom we have relationships. If God wants a relationship with us, then the necessary first step is for us to at least know that he exists. So, why hasn't God made his existence a lot more obvious, the same way it's obvious that our friends and family exist? One popular answer to this question is that God doesn't want to force us to believe that he exists. God doesn't want to compel us to believe in him, and this is a good thing, because forcing us to believe in him would rob us of our free will, and we need free will in order to enter into a truly loving relationship with someone. There's more than enough evidence to reasonably infer that God exists, but there's also enough wiggle room for people to deny it. And I think that God wants it that way. I think that this is why we don't have a we have, we have a God who's a gentleman who's not going to compel belief, because then it wouldn't really be belief. I mean, there's an act of 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 freedom involved, and in even deciding which is the most reasonable inference. And if I remove that freedom from you, you could call this love, you could call this faith, you could call this belief, but really it's just a pro, pre-programmed, overwhelmed kind of compulsion that we, we that God has put on you. As with many answers given by Christian apologists, this answer commits the apologist to an idea which they would strongly reject in any other situation. If this is how they believe relationships should work, if they really think that a genuine relationship requires some wiggle room to disbelieve in the other person's existence, this is going to create a lot of problems. For example, I would ask someone like J. Warner Wallace, do you love your wife? I'm sure you do. Now, do you ever struggle with doubts about your wife's existence? No, you believe absolutely that your wife exists. She lives in your house. She talks to you face to face. She frequently enters your field of vision. She touches you. She moves objects around you. She smells a certain way. Her existence is inescapable. But is it wrong for your wife to compel you to believe in her existence like this? Is your wife doing you a disservice by making her existence inescapable? Is your loving relationship with your wife somehow ruined by the fact that you are forced to believe that she exists? Does your inability to doubt her existence mean that you never truly fell in love with her? It seems to me that an apologist like J. Warner Wallace would have to say, yes. In fact, if it really is better to give people in a relationship some wiggle room to doubt each other's existence, then realistically, the best thing Wallace's wife could do for their marriage would be to move far away and to only communicate via email. This way, Wallace would need to have a certain level of faith to believe that it's really her on the other end year after year, not someone else or an AI chatbot. If apologists like Wallace truly believed that loving relationships require, or at least benefit from, the freedom to doubt each other's existence, then why don't they approach every relationship this way? What is the relevant difference between your wife and your God, which makes it okay for your wife's existence to be inescapable, but not for God's existence to be inescapable? Wallace doesn't say. The idea that a truly loving relationship requires or benefits from wiggle room to doubt the other party's existence is only invoked to save Christianity from absurdity, not because there's any actual reason to think this is how loving relationships work. Now, all that being said, Christian apologists will sometimes clarify their response by saying that, actually, the reason God remains hidden is not because this is intrinsically the best way to build a loving relationship, but because, by being hidden, God allows people to doubt the existence of the associated punishment and reward. If God made his existence inescapably obvious, the argument goes, then this would bring with it an inescapable belief in some kind of punishment and reward, most notably heaven and hell. This, in turn, would prevent people from expressing genuine love for their creator, instead becoming overwhelmed by feelings of fear and self-preservation. 
If God was a tangible being on the planet, with all his power and glory, you would worship him and be obedient to his laws because you'd be afraid of him and be afraid of being sent to hell for being disobedient. Your entire motivation for being good would not be because you love God or were thankful for what he did for you on the cross. You would be good because you would be worried about yourself. In other words, you wouldn't be good for goodness sake or for God's sake. You would be good for your own sake. And that's the problem. And you know what? I agree that the knowledge of punishment and reward probably would sour a potential relationship with God and motivate people to act instead out of selfishness and fear. It's not exactly the kind of thing you tell someone on a first date or in a love letter. But there's a problem with this answer. If the knowledge of punishment and reward is what sours a potential relationship with God, then why wouldn't God simply make this information ambiguous and uncertain? rather than making his existence ambiguous and uncertain. If the knowledge of heaven and hell really is such a danger to a genuine, loving relationship, then couldn't God simply make his existence obvious, but not make it obvious what, if anything, happens after you die? This would eliminate the problem of the carrot and stick, and it would allow people to genuinely love God based on who he is and what he's given us. To put it simply, God did not need to tell us about the punishment and reward of heaven and hell. If the knowledge of heaven and hell is what sours a genuine, loving relationship with God, then the existence of heaven and hell should be ambiguous, not the existence of God. When you write the entire Bible, only to realize it was mostly oversharing. And so, the question remains, why is God so hidden? Why is God's bare existence so non-obvious? Why does anyone struggle with doubt about the existence of an all-powerful being who wants us to love him? Clearly, it's not because this is the best way to cultivate a loving relationship, nor is it because it conceals the knowledge of punishment and reward. So why is it the case? Why can't this lovesick God-being just call us on the phone, or join us for a board game? You know like the people in our lives who we actually have relationships with. Why doesn't this person who wants a relationship with us act like a person who wants a relationship with us? Frankly, if it doesn't look like a duck, if it doesn't quack like a duck, and if it's not reaching out to you like an actual person who actually wants a relationship with you, then it's probably not a duck. A duck! <laughs>